Good morning, Joseph. Thank you very much for joining us. You are co-chair of IPPIS uh, Global Assessment for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. We appreciate you joining us this morning. Good morning, Sean. Nice to see you. So I would like to ask you about biodiversity loss. Uh, how big is the threat and are you hopeful? Well, as we have elaborated in our assessment, the threat is quite dramatic, I would say. We estimate that one out of eight species is prone to extinction in the near future if we don't counteract. So that's not surely not a sign for optimism. On the other hand, I think we still have many options to turn it around. Otherwise, I, didn't, I wouldn't do the work I'm doing. So I'm very convinced of, of this, that we can achieve at least uh, some successes. We can achieve that we lost less species than we anticipated at the moment if we are taking the right decisions, decisions on the political, but also on the, on the individual level. So I'm not pessimistic, but I'm kind of, let's say, concerned. Can you speak about the biggest contributors to, to biodiversity loss? Is it climate change? Is it human activity? So we made an analysis in this global assessment, looking at the relative importance uh, of drivers, direct drivers in the last 50 years. And it was dominated so far, it still is dominated by the change of land use, actually land use and sea use in the marine part. It's followed by direct exploitation, like hunting in some cases, or exploitation of forests, uh, uh, parts of the forest, or also fishing in the marine and freshwater part. Number three is then climate change at the moment, but it's, uh, let's say, really kick, uh, catching up, let's put it like this. It's getting to overtake the other ones in the near future, I assume. Then we have uh, the uh, pollution of environments, plastics in the ocean, for example, and the fifth one is invasive species. These are the five, let's say, most important direct drivers. But all of them are based on indirect drivers, which is the human system. So it's all about human activity in the end. It's about our demography, it's about our social system, about economics, about international trades, all these things come together. So it's the indirect drivers which drive the direct drivers, put it like this. So that's uh, the part where we have to get active, I think, the indirect ones. So if I take it from there to the travel and tourism sector, is it a friend or an enemy? Well, it depends where you are and how the setting is, of course. So uh, I can imagine many cases it's a friend. If you take Africa as an example, all these areas like Kalahari or the other yeah, national parks, which are heavily dependent on tourists to come there in order to survive, to maintain the biodiversity. If this doesn't happen, I guess the economic basis is not there any longer to maintain the species, the, the big five, for example. And I guess it's an important uh, source of income for people, which makes people also preserve this kind of, let's say, very unique ecosystem. So here is surely a friend. Of course, it always depends on the quantitative approach and how people do it. And, and in detail, it's always a bit more complicated. It might be an enemy if you look at the climate change issues, traveling long distances, the carbon footprint, for example, surely adds to the problems we have. So there's a real trade-off. Uh, it's very hard to, to say in general what's better, uh, what, what's a friend and what's not a friend. But I guess we always have to look at individual cases, how to best uh, solve this reducing CO2 emissions and just the same keeping ecotourism as an income source in many parts of the globe. Then you also can think, think about ecotourism or tourism on a more local scale. Look, I'm from Central Europe, from Germany. So we have lots of people enjoying nature, of course. So going out to just around the corner and making a short trip by car. Then you spend your holidays walking in the forests. So this something truly is touristic. And uh, in this case, everybody actually enjoys nature. And I think we need this in order that people appreciate what is out there. If you don't experience it, it you will not be tempted to protect it. But like this. So you will not be, let's say, ready for some kind of shortcuts here and there, some kind of, let's say, uh, yeah, let's say less income or uh, more economic uh, problems. You will be ready to pay for something if you don't appreciate it. So I guess tourism here is an important uh, role in, in terms of contacting people and nature. So the importance of both the material and the non-material values of nature to the, to the tourism economy. I want to conclude, Joseph, by a question in your area, one of your areas of specialization, that's adaptation. Even if we do our best to mitigate climate change, uh, there will still be a rise in temperature and unavoidable climate change impacts. From a, from a European perspective, um, what's happening in terms of adapting to this, some of these unavoidable realities? 
Well, it's a matter, for example, of landscape planning in the context of conservation of species. As you know, we have uh, this called so-called cultural landscapes, so man-made landscapes, actually, historically all modified by people in the long history, uh, which means they are also highly dynamic. Uh, so if you want to maintain uh, species in the larger, let's say, geographical setting of Central Europe, you have to enable them to migrate, in our case, to the north or further up. But especially to the north means they have to cover quite some distances for the suitable habitats, which means we need to implement more connectivity measures for the conservation of these endangered species. While at the same time, of course, we have to be careful for about invasive species. So there's a kind of trade-off there. So connectivity is connectivity for everybody or every species, the good ones and the bad yeah. ones. So that's, uh, that's not, not easy, but it has to be done on a specific setting. And it's combined with certain land use activities. So our systems are all man driven. That means you need a certain extensive or not, not too intensive land use in order to maintain this high diversity, which we have in our secondary grasslands. So from Africa, you know, the primary grasslands and we have grasslands made by man, highly diverse in terms of insects, for example. And this uh, have to be maintained in a kind of continuity across the continent in order to make species survive because they can find new habitats, new areas, if climate change is, let's say, putting some impact on them. Yeah, good. In terms of species migration, we have also had great uh, projects in Africa, the transfrontier conservation areas, um, allowing that east-west migration between South Africa, Mozambique, and, and other neighboring countries. Uh, so, so some good work out there. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Much appreciated. Thank you, Sean. It was nice talking to you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.